Uh, a very good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I know we are just starting with this uh, session full of knowledge and it takes a while for all of us to gear up and wire up for uh, the academic fiesta that is about to begin. Um, I hope you all had great journeys uh, to Ahmedabad because I know my fellow panelists and fellow uh, speakers are also traveling all the way from Jammu and all corners of the country. So welcome all of you to Ahmedabad. Um, I'm Dr. Mitali Vasavda. Uh, thank you for the very good uh, and uh, liberal uh, introduction. We'll uh, get on with the uh, topic that I've been um, asked to speak on, which is uh, diabetes, uh, pregnancy. Um, volume bada bada, na? Ah. Yeah, diabetes, pregnancy, and its effect on the uh, developing fetal brain. Um, we all know that's very important as parents, as um, um, you know, uh, women who are pregnant and who are going to have babies, uh, a good mental development, neurological development is something that's always on all parents' minds. Uh, and um, just a few slides to begin with are regarding um, for us to appreciate how big diabetes is as a problem. Uh, it's a growing problem. Uh, it's doubled in the last 20 years from 108 million approximately 1980s to over uh, 422 million. 16.9% um, women uh, have uh, hyperglycemia during pregnancy, which is uh, when you screen them as per the WHO criteria. Uh, they account for almost 21.4 million out of the 127 million live births. Um, this is also uh, to an extent increasing because of the rising obesity. Uh, rising maternal age at pregnancy and conception and also because of better awareness and better screening that is being offered. Um, International Diabetes Federation um, had a value which said that around 15.5% of diabetes uh, exist uh, in pregnancies out of which 12.8 are gestational. Uh, the rest are pre-gestational and uh, pre-existing diabetes which had not been diagnosed so far but they have been uh, diagnosed just during pregnancy. If we look at the epidemiology, um, the reported morbidity associated with GDM ranges from 1 to 14 percent worldwide. Uh, um, Southeast Asia, uh, we need to be more careful, the reason being the highest prevalence of GDM is perhaps in our part of the world. Uh, having worked abroad, I know that we used to preferentially screen women from, uh, with origins from Southeast Asia. And that is how uh, important, so for, uh, you know, perspective for us practicing in our country, um, almost every woman should be screened, apart from uh, the practice that we sometimes see that only risk factors exist, those women are screened. So that is something that we all need to change. Estimated prevalence would be 23 to 25 percent. Putting it into a clinical perspective, one in every four women could be having diabetes or hyperglycemia during pregnancy. Um, this is in addition to a very, very high load of type 2 diabetes also that exists in our country. Uh, Southeast Asian populations are in a way unique because uh, with our population, GDM can also exist at much lower BMIs compared to other population where normally obese uh, patients with other risk factors are the ones that we normally consider at a higher risk. Classification, I think uh, with all the physicians, diabetologists, um, you know, I don't need to talk about classification, but just to complete the list, um, it's a type 1 diabetes, which we call as uh, insulin dependent. It's juvenile in onset, about 5 to 10 percent of the diabetes can be accounted for. And the, pa and the pathology operative here is a beta cell destruction and an absolute insulin deficiency. A type 2, which is accounting for 90 to 95 percent, where peripheral insulin resistance and a relative insulin lack is what we think are the modus why it operates. Gestational is unique in a way that pancreatic beta cells are not able to keep up with the insulin demand because of a peripheral insulin resistance, because of all the hormones that are kicking in during pregnancy, including prolactin, estrogen, progesterone, and all the other hormones. There's also this uh, Modi, which is uh, not the most popular Modi nowadays that we know, but it's maturity onset diabetes of the young, which accounts for 1 to 2%. Uh, it's a monogenic disorder, and it leads to an impaired insulin production. Um, glucokinase is the gene that is the mutated in most of the times. All right. 
Now, diagnosis, I have put this slide, but I know that there is a huge controversy in every aspect of how we diagnose uh, uh, diabetes in pregnancy, starting from when it should be offered first as a screening test uh, to um, what are the criteria and how the test should be administered. So I'm just keeping it simple, saying that there should be ideally an oral glucose tolerance test. Um, Earlier, the better for people coming from a very, very high risk background. Normally, during pregnancy, we do it above, about 24 to 28 weeks. However, um, this might just be too late to pick out on the patients who have a pre-gestational diabetes that has not been uh, checked so far and who have gone through the entire organogenesis phase for the baby um, during the time when they are undetected. Um, why we are doing this is because fasting plasma glucose alone will fail to diagnose approximately 30% of the cases, which means one third of the patients won't be diagnosed. Um, it is the only test where we can confidently diagnose an impaired glucose tolerance as well. And it is frequently uh, needed to confirm or exclude an abnormality of glucose tolerance in asymptomatic people. So if there is no symptoms or there is no other problem, but still you want to go ahead and do then this is the test that we need to um, administer. It should also be used in individuals with a fasting plasma glucose between 6.1 to 6.9, which is 110 to 125 mg per dl, uh, to determine what is the glucose tolerance level of the um, lady in question. Now, why we are very, very uh, interested, especially from the neurodevelopment point of view, for a pre-existing diabetes mellitus in pregnancy, uh, because number one, it increases your risk of having congenital anomalies in the first place. The second thing is that it strongly correlates with the patient's HbA1c level or the glucose control or the glycemic control um, just before pregnancy and during the first uh, one to two months of pregnancy. Now, as we can see here, um, uh, you know, there's a background risk of congenital anomalies with normal levels of sugar, but it rises to about 5% when uh, the HbA1c levels reach up to 8 and almost 25% when HbA1c levels go up to 10 and beyond. So this is how well we can correlate adverse pregnancy outcomes with the um, HbA1c levels. Now, what could be these effects on the fetal development? So, uh, this is the most common medical disorder in pregnancy and hence we should be very watchful. Uh, there are a lot of perinatal complications inside the uterus or in utero. Uh, the most important could be in the earlier times, uh, congenital anomalies, uh, macrosomic babies uh, and of course miscarriages and stillbirths. Long-term effects would be more in terms of the uh, uh, you know, long-term development, cognitive impairment, working memory problems, uh, language development, and uh, there is this hypothesis of Barker which says that there is a fetal origin of um, pathologies that come out in adulthood. So this also has a huge bearing on uh, women who are diagnosed in pregnancy and especially who have a pre-gestational diagnosis or diabetes. Um, coming to the embryology, so if you want to understand what effects it has on uh, the fetus, we also need to sort of revisit, go back to our embryology days and get our heads around what, what's the embryology of the brain development. Um, we all know that the fetus begins as a zygote. Uh, it has stem cells and these possess the ability to differentiate into specialized cells of various types in a uh, correct uh, microenvironment. Euglycemia or the correct glucose level uh, is critical in maintaining the properties of these stem cells. We also know that a high glucose microenvironment significantly affects the biological activity of the stem cells. And this can have a potential effect on all the organs because ultimately they are all going to develop from the stem cells. And uh, fetal neuronal development in particular is very sensitive and susceptible to these changes in the microenvironment. Coming to embryology uh, specifics, it is uh, the organogenesis period is from zero to eight weeks. Hyperglycemia, we know, is a known teratogen. It uh, causes teratogenesis by altering the gene expression, uh, which is required for neural tube development. It also causes premature senescence. Uh, senescence meaning a permanent cell cycle arrest. Uh, and interferes with the neurulation. And perhaps because of this, the most important after effect that happens is a failure of closure of the neural tube. 
Neurulation. Neurulation is a fundamental event in the embryogenesis that culminates in the formation of the neural tube, which is a precursor for the brain and the spinal cord. It begins with the formation of a neural plate as a thickening on the dorsum ectoderm, on the dorsal ectoderm. A closure of the cranial neuro tube, neural tube is essential not only for maintenance of brain development, but also for the initial formation of the skull. The fusion of the neural folds is subject to debate concerning the, uh, you know, where the fusion actually begins and how it goes forward. But for practical understanding, we all know that it starts from the middle and it proceeds towards both the um, uh, extreme parts. Neural tube closure, again, depends on a lot of factors such as convergent extension of the neural plate, neuroepithelial apoptosis, neural crest cell migration, proliferation and differentiation. Uh, this development and closure of the tube is completed approximately by the 28th day after conception. So the important thing here for us to note is that uh, a lady would normally seek a gynecologist's opinion or care after the first missed period, which is somewhere five to six weeks with a positive pregnancy test. And most of the neural development has already been completed by the time that she actually reaches a gynecologist. Okay, so again, uh, brain development, uh, it happens in the, uh, this particular manner. It starts as three primary brain vesicles, uh, which is prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon. Uh, prosencephalon then goes on, divides into telencephalon and diencephalon. So the three uh, primary vesicle stage happens somewhere about three to four weeks of the embryological life. Um, and it goes on and divides into five, out of which telencephalon and diencephalon are involved intimately with the brain formation. Telencephalon differentiates into the cerebrum, and the diencephalon forms the parts of the lower brain, which are the thalamus, uh, hypothalamus, epithalamus, and other parts of the uh, uh, lower brain. And this happens around the age of five weeks of the embryo. If you look at the timeline of development again, there's the phase of neurulation that happens in the first uh, couple of weeks. Um, but it's important to note here that even after birth, uh, myelination, synaptogenesis, and various other modifications continue to happen uh, to the fetal brain, which is uh, you know, now a neonate, or uh, up to even sometimes two years of the uh, neonatal's life. So looking at the neurophysiology, many biological changes occur in a diabetic mother, which can impact the fetal neurodevelopment. Uh, these could be changes in the neurotransmitters, neural and integrity, uh, way the which uh, synapse acts and growth factor expressions. Hyperglycemia is the most important of these changes that causes neurodevelopmental and cognitive changes in the newborn. Uh, fetal hyperglycemia causes hyperinsulinemia, chronic tissue hypoxia, a decreased level of fetal iron. Altogether, these increase the oxidative stress that the developing embryo has to face, which then goes on to causing a diabetic embryopathy. Uh, there's an increased generation of free radicals, increased expression of nitrogen oxide synthase, which leads to more formation of the reactive oxygen species. There are also alterations in the signal pathway of arachidonic acid, inositol, and prostaglandins, all which are playing some role in the inflammatory, chronic inflammatory milieu that hyperglycemia creates. There's also an increase in the intracellular concentration of the advanced glycosylation products, which also add to this problem. Uh, the infant brain, hence, is extremely sensitive to hyperglycemia. Uh, maternal hyperglycemia leads to excessive production of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the placenta also. Uh, neonatal hyperglycemia um, uh, increases the production of interleukin 1 beta, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, all which we know are uh, cytokines active during an inflammatory process. So this causes a low-grade inflammation. Induction of the pro-inflammatory response uh, of activated microglia to increase the sensitivity of inflammatory responses of the central nervous system. Hence, all in all, hyperglycemia affects a baby's nervous system, including the brain and spine and nerves. It leads to failure or it can lead to failure of the neural tube um, development or the failure of it to close as it should be in the first uh, month or the first few weeks of life. Uh, of the embryo. Uh, this is more pronounced when this is a pre-existing diabetes since the embryo is exposed to this high level of sugar during the rapid neuronal development in the zero to eight weeks time. 
oxygen free radicals apoptosis inhibition of neural crest uh, cell migration and differentiation these are all the other effects which ultimately lead to the teratogenicity so if we look at this chart there is uh, chronic hyperglycemia and ketonemia causing alterations in the signaling pathways these all, along with the changes in the reactive uh, nitrogen species and oxygen species ultimately can cause gene dysregulation and apoptosis problems uh, again leading to either embryopathy in the earlier part of the pregnancy and fetopathy in the later half and these can all affect depending on the various timelines blastogenesis organogenesis they can have effect on the uh, baby's or the fetus's growth uh, in terms of macrosomia or iugr in late pregnancy and postnatally in terms of uh, all the other problems that we discussed uh, chronology of events blastogenesis phase uh, this can cause early malformations and there is a very very high risk of miscarriages uh, when uh, uh, blastocyst is exposed to, exposed to very high sugar levels organogenesis again can cause a lot of malformations especially neural tube defects late pregnancy uh, it can cause changes of macrosomia and igr and postnatally learning behavioral and high long term risk of diabetes and obesity uh, again uh, this is uh, the various ways in type 1 type 2 diabetes and the changes it has reactive oxygen species uh, there are also issues with dna methylation histone modification and micro rna changes we'll come to each one of them in the subsequent slides uh, in terms of the cns malformations um, they have a effect on the hippocampus development and the cortical development so oxidative stress um, they all, these are all the changes that an oxidative stress can have which is attenuation of gaba receptor functions uh, decrease synaptic efficiency of the hippocampal cells uh, inhibition of the dopamine beta hydroxylase increase in a superoxide dismutase activity now if we know superoxide dismutase activity is going to go up when the inflammation is going to be on the higher side so that's again points out to the fact that there is a chronic inflammation milieu and decrease in the level of arachidonic acid a uh, potential role of uh, this this all are going to elevate the oxidative stress pro inflammatory condition is set up with cytokines such as tnf alpha and il6 um, which has been found in an increased quantity in infants of diabetic mothers uh, cytokine imbalance is strongly associated with the degree and the severity of the neurodevelopmental disorder uh there's also reduction in the incidence of congenital anomalies seen in infants of diabetic mothers where antioxidant supplements have been given from earlier on for whatever reason uh, you know, uh, knowingly or unknowingly um coming to the reactive oxygen species uh, gdm is associated with oxidative stress because of the mechanisms we mentioned earlier uh, this can inactivate several biologically active proteins and lipids we all know that myelination maturation differentiation of neurons it requires uh, lipids um, when they are denatured there can be an issue with all these processes uh, there also have been some animal studies where a influence of high maternal sugars have uh, been there on the insulin receptors and the igf1 receptors and these are very important in cns development and function more so and more pronounced at the hippocampus now hippocampus is the organ that is going to be associated with memory both spatial and uh, declarative it also plays a vital role in regulating learning memory coding and memory consolidation so such children can go on and have issues in their studies and their education as well insulin like growth factor in insulin these belong to the insulin super family they exert a profound cns uh, uh, development and function effect um and they have a wide variety of biological spectrum of action uh, they uh, neuronal and glial proliferation differentiation survival synaptogenesis and longevity uh, and neuroregeneration these all can be impacted by these receptors um when these are adversely impacted because of uh, high sugars or hyperglycemia the resultant changes can also occur micro rna Uh, the uh, the expression of micro rna have been seen to be altered in uh, patients with an uncontrolled uh, di diabetes micro rna are small endogenous non coding rnas that suppress gene expression at the post transcriptional level they play a very important role during embryonic development 
Recent evidence also suggests that they could be uh, important in neurulation in mice and neural tube developments in human beings. And they have been identified as inducers of cellular senescence. We spoke about senescence in the previous slide where we said that it caused a permanent cell cycle arrest. And this could be one of the reasons why we see that the neural tube defects occur in uh, diabetic babies. Again, hypoxia and polycythemia, a chronic in utero uh, hyperglycemia and hyperinsulinemia, it triggers polycythemia. Now, uh, you know, you might think Madam, that... can you please uh, summarize uh, yeah. as early as possible? Sure, okay, so we'll skip these uh, because they're all the pathogenesis. Uh, and we'll go to this final one. Okay, so this sort of summarizes the uh, previous slides, which is there are immune adaptations, there are uh, there is anemia and iron deficiency, lipid abnormalities and uh, epigenetic changes. Uh, manifestations in the fetus could be neural tube, cognitive, motor and psychosocial. Uh, the common neural tube defects could be either open or closed, open where it is uh, not covered by skin or meninges and uh, the other open ones, uh, it's in direct communication outside. Okay, so I'll just uh, show you a couple of slides which show uh, anencephaly, three times more common in diabetic mothers. Basically, the bro bone, uh, bones and brain do not develop uh, properly. Uh, classified into three types, cranioracesis, where there is an absolute uh, no development of brain and skull, uh, hollow anencephaly and meroanencephaly. Pre-gestational diabetes, this is much more common than with a gestational diabetes. As you can see, the cranial vault and... Uh, Calvarium above are not developed at all and there's a cycloptic eye. Most of these are not compatible with life. Holoprosencephaly, 40 times more common in diabetic mothers. Um, it is a failure of the prosencephalon to develop normally and the brain to divide. Uh, again, there are a couple of types of it. Um, this is how the division looks. So there's the central white part, which is the uh, CSF and the division of the brain is not complete. Encephalocele, uh, you can see in the uh, picture where it's marked, there's a protrusion of the brain matter or the meninges outside. Again, it looks like this on MRI uh, and caudal regression syndrome, very common in diabetics. In fact, it is considered a hallmark of diabetic pregnancies, 200 to 600 times more common where uh, it gives the appearance of a mermaid uh, syndrome. This is a lethal abnormality, but uh, this is still associated with this. Neurodevelopmental alterations that can happen later on could be uh, cognitive, motor and psychosocial, ADHD, autism and schizophrenia also have been shown to have some association. Uh, neurotrophins, again, there are, uh, uh, this is a little more in the detail, so we'll skip that. Um, certain MRI studies were done, diffusion tensor imaging studies, which showed that individuals of mothers with GDM showed microstructural white matter uh, changes and defects. Um, they're also noted to be fatty acid metabolism uh, disturbances in diabetic, uh, uh, you know, mums, where uh, DHA, which is essential and uh, you know required for the brain development to happen, uh, levels were reduced in babies of diabetic mother. There was a tracer study that pointed toward an impaired placental DHA uptake, which is a critical step for appropriate DHA levels. Normal pregnancies, DHA levels in the third trimester onwards are going to increase, which don't happen in these pregnancies as per the studies. Um, so we'll go to the prevention quickly. Um, Folate uh, supplementation, very important, five, uh, five milligrams of folate or high uh, amount of folate is uh, going to act uh, very importantly as a preventive step to reduce the incidence of these um, abnormalities. Many studies were done which established the role uh, of folates indisputably. Uh, folate cannot be synthesized in the human body and it's required for de novo purine biosynthesis. Purines and pyrimidines are DNA bases are bases which are required in formation of DNA and RNA. We are aware of that. And uh, folate gives the eighth and the second carbon atom in these um, things. S-adenosyl methionine, which is also universal methyl donor in uh, DNA formation and uh, remodeling is also reduced. These are the relations between folate, B12 and the DHA cycles. There are linkages everywhere. Uh, also, levels of B12 have been associated to uh, low B12s associated with higher chances of abnormalities and which is why B12 supplementation is also required if the levels are on the lower side. Um, brain development postnatally also goes on and when there is a problem, uh, it manifests as ADHD, autism, memory impairment and cognitive dysfunctions. 
um, supplementation of formula milk with a higher level of DHA is also something that has been recommended to reduce the effects postnatally. In conclusion, uh, incidence of congenital anomalies uh, in diabetic mothers are common. Hyperglycemia, hyperinsulinemia look like they are the most important, uh, you know, vil villains here. Uh, several biological changes occur and evidence to suggest the disturbance of intellectual and behavioral function uh, and hippocampal structure function modification exist. Uh, what do we need to do? Strict control of uh, sugar, high index of suspicion and testing, folic acid supplementation, B12 supplementation may also be of value and postnatal DHA supplementation might also be helpful. Thank you.